It seems amazing, really, that Ziggy and the Spiders were only together for about 18 months, but there's no doubt in my mind that the collaboration made for one of the best of its time. I think I was more like a man and he was more like a woman, you know. These guys all came from Hull, you know, we're going to play a rock and roll band, a lot of songs and all that, and I said, yeah, yeah, it's great. Huh? Do you want to see what we're going to wear? You looked at David, who was like from another planet, and then you looked at Mick, who was like God's gift to women, you know, I mean, it was like a lethal combination. People came to see me as much as they would come to see him. I said, you've got eyelashes like a cow. Put mascara on them and stop fussing. Oh, well, when you say it like that, it's different. Oh, that's all. Is that all right? I said, yes, now I can see your eyes. He put lipstick on the next time. I don't think he enjoyed, you know, they often got called faggots, and it was hard in some places. His body was built, he was gorgeous and glorious. What more could you want? He was one of the loveliest people I've ever met. He was also a, a great collaborator. Holly came from Miami, FLA. The thing with Ronald was I could very rarely understand a word he said. He had a whole accent. <laughs> Chasing after me. I spent a lot of time with David, and he used to say, when I found Mick Ronson, I, I, I found my Jeff Beck. He was musical. That's all he cared about was the music. He understood the theatricality that was needed for certain solos. Mick Ronson was the best guitar player that David Bowie ever had. He knew how to elevate David that bit more. And by doing that, he elevated himself a little bit more. Where they're bringing you in is the solo. And then just I don't keep know where that is. Right where you're coming in. <laughs> It's the first real time that we've worked together in almost 20 years. There's absolutely no doubt the icing on the cake when it came to the musicianship was Ronson. Boy, Ronson's good. Wow. If Mick had lived on, he would have become a major producer and arranger. And of course, he would have remained one of Rock's great guitar players. Tons pub in Beckenham High Street. It became an art slab, which was a movement at the time. It started in Drury Lane in London. The arts laboratory in Drury Lane was kind of the template, really, the sort of mixed media idea of merging, you know, music, dance, poetry, expression. And it became absolutely, totally magnetic for the, the entire youth movement of South London. I used to do David's mother's hair. So I used to in Beckenham High Street, Evelyn Padgett's. And she used to talk to me about her son, David. And it was Mrs. Jones. It wasn't until she mentioned Space Oddity that my ears kind of pricked up. I said, Space Oddity? Are we talking about David Bowie? Yes, she said, I'm his mum. And that's how I met his mother. And then she brought Angie into the shop. I came back after being away for a couple of days and there was a notebook by the bed that said a sort of beginnings of a song, Beautiful Angie. Angie Bowie was a very loud American young girl who was definitely bisexual and was the main force, strength behind David Bowie through to the Hammersmith Odeon. Soon you'll grow, so take a chance with a couple of cooks hung up on romancing. First time I saw David, he's walking down Beckenham High Street wearing a dress, and he's with this girl who looks a bit like a bloke. She had like a man suit on and heavy shoes and short hair. I've always lived in my parents' marvelous basement flat, and David used to come around a lot because I had that big place. The Fun Palace, as Lionel Bart used to call it. So, and Angie called it the bunker. 
as soon as Angie came on the scene, they started flat hunting. And so she found this place just up the road, rather pretentiously known as Haddon Hall. It was this fabulous place with this huge stained glass window, 20 feet high. The whole length of the hall, not one window, the whole wall, stained glass, like a church. You stay in a lover story? That huge hall was absolutely full. It was an atrium, trees, shrubs, it was glorious. But you have to understand there were 18 cats and the cats made themselves right at home. So if you can appreciate that it took us two weeks and probably 10 gallons of bleach. Mm. He was creating this kind of weird post sort of hippie, proto punk almost thing. You know, it was a weird setup in Haddon Hall. It was kind of like the London equivalent of Andy Warhol's The Factory, if you want to sort of put it like that. Kind of that's what David might have had in his mind that it could become. To me, it was always like a set. It was like a stage set. Mick Ronson appeared on the scene round about that time. We all started with a drummer that used to play in this group that I played with when I was living in Hull at that time. I was working as a gardener. I was kind of pushing a lawnmower around the school gardens, you know, like, around the rose bushes and everything. And he, and he was the drummer for a short while in this group that I played with called the Rats. And there were a few rats around in the UK, but this particular rats were the rats from Hull, led by a guy called Benny Marshall. And he had various lineups, including John Cambridge and including Mick Ronson. I remember seeing the rats and thinking, what an amazing guitarist. Uh, I didn't meet him at the time, I just saw the band, but they were fantastic, the Rats, really, really good. There was a lot of sort of popular bands around, but the Rats, I think, was probably, you know, the most popular. But of course they would be, wouldn't they? Mick had already played for a producer called Gus Dudgeon, so we heard about Mick, and uh, it was John Cambridge who mentioned that uh, Mick was in my band, the Rats. He played with uh, another group called Junior's Eyes, they used to back David Bowie on some gigs, I think, for a short while. Well, he said, you've got to meet this guy, David Bowie. You know, he said, uh, you should come down to London, you know. But then it came as a complete surprise that he was a gardener and he wasn't uh, playing music anymore. So I, I came down to London and we were sitting uh, around his house. I started playing some of my songs on a 12-string and he plugged in his Gibson. And even though he was playing at a very low volume, the energy and grit cut through the room and he immediately established himself as a very well-defined player. We had a John Peel show in two days to do and it was just going to be John Cambridge, myself and David. David was going to be on acoustic guitar. But there was some, some electric guitar needed for the songs. Well, he was you know, sitting around playing guitar, like sort of cross-legged on the floor and everything, you know. And I picked up a guitar and I was just played along. And... When he played his first few notes and just was getting his tone out of his amplifier, David and I looked at each other and we, we went like silently, wow, like that. He said, uh, oh, you, I've got a radio show to, to play this evening. Will you, uh, will you come and play, you know? So I said, yeah, all right then. So with a couple of hours of rehearsal, Mick joined us. I didn't really know what was going on, so... I kind of stood on his left side so I could watch his hands and watch where he was playing, you know. And so I, I didn't know any of the numbers really, so I, I kind of just watched him and kind of played through everything. And He picked up chord sequences really fast and he was then able to improvise around them pretty much immediately. The radio show sounded pretty good considering how little rehearsal there'd been. Are you going to be doing gigs with this band? <laughs> yes, we're going to do some gigs. I'll be Michael. Michael doesn't really know, he's just come down from Hull and uh, I met him for the first time about two days ago through John, the drummer, who's worked with me once. I see, but you, you are planning to go on the road, as it were? Yes, yes, very shortly. And I guess everybody kind of liked it. And then from then he said, why don't you just go back to Hull and get your things and come back down? We got to Hull, we got to Mrs. Ronson's house. Rono came from the back of the house in a shirt pale blue stripes and white and starched collar and the cuffs rolled up 
and he came in and he didn't see us, we were over here. And he walked over to his mom and he grabbed her around the waist and he gave her a big kiss on both cheeks. He said, well, mom, I'm off now. And she said, no, David and Angie are here. And I think they want to talk with you. He said, oh, I was going to meet them. And, and he came over and he shook David's hand. Immediately, they clicked, immediately. And it was as though, you know, it was always meant to be. He loved him enough to tell him to move in. We kind of walk in the driveway and there'd be like these two big pillars and eight and nine steps up to the front door, a big front door, you know. When you walked in, you saw a big staircase right in front of you, a big, great big wide staircase. And we sort of went up and they had this balcony around the top, very high ceiling. And then you had the rooms off on, you know, different rooms off to the side. And the, these rooms were massive. So it was like a mansion. And it was real cheap too, you know, because David only paid seven pounds a month for rent. I'd never seen rooms that big before. And I come from like, I grew up in a terraced house, you know, a little tiny terrace house with uh, no electricity upstairs and things, you know. And we used to have a tin bath, you know. We used to have to fill it up with a kettle, you know. So there they were living in Hatton Hall, and I used to go down on Sunday there I'd see David and Angie hanging out, David writing his songs, Angie finding food for everyone. And there was the spiders from Mars in their embryonic days, sleeping on sort of mattresses up on the minstrels gallery of Haddon Hall. And that's when I first met Mick Ronson, who from now onwards I always have always called Rono. I can't bear it when people call him Mick, because if you talk about a Mick, you know, I know about five Micks, so, but there's only one Rono. There was like a, a little wine cellar downstairs. Wow, it was tiny, this place. And uh, Tony Visconti went down there and he, he kind of, you know, th threw all the rubbish out and he put some sort of like foam on the walls and egg cartons and things like that, soundproofing. And this was like a rehearsal room. And uh, we only rehearsed in there, I don't know, half a dozen times. I mean, it was so, it was like being in a dungeon or something. Towards the end of the Space Oddity album, he was also present at the mixes. So in those days, you didn't have computer automation and tape was quite noisy. So I definitely remember Nick and David Bowie and myself and John Cambridge all on our knees in front of the console, pushing the volumes up and down and hitting the buttons that were the on and off buttons for the tracks and all that because tape was just abysmal in those days. Yeah, that was a fond memory. So Mick really joined into the spirit of finishing that album, although he just played on that one track, Wild Eyed Boy from Free Cloud. We called the band Hype. We did uh, one or two lab things, and I was dressed in a gangster suit. Tony Visconti was sort of dressed as Batman or something with a cape. Ironically, they made costumes for myself, John Cambridge, and Mick. And when it came to a costume for David, we ran out of money, so David got the short end. <laughs> I remember we played this gig at the Roundhouse, and I can't smoke grass or anything. I remember this guy, he said, oh, he said, have a puff of this joint, you know? And I thought, yeah, all right, then just like two talks or something, you know? And I man, I was so stoned, you know? I, I mean, I don't even remember going on the plane and getting off again. What I didn't realize is that Mick was a trained uh, pianist and uh, he studied violin when he was a kid. So he had these two other major instruments under his belt. And then he noticed that I had scored an arrangement for something on The Man Who Sold the World. So Mick was like looking over my shoulder and he said, can you teach me how you score? Because he could read and write music, but he didn't know the rules of scoring music when you write for a, a bunch of musicians. You know, you have to write all the parts underneath each other and they have to all line up visually, and then you have to take it off the score paper and write out the individual parts. That I showed him how to do. I watched him working with Tony Visconti one night, and I said, you want to write the parts, don't you? And he said, yes, and I said, well, there's no shows, there's no gigs for a while. Why don't you go study music in home? Then you'll never, ever have to watch someone else write the parts for you because you have symphonies and orchestras in your mind. And he was like, two weeks later, he was gone. And Mick came back and he could orchestrate anything, write parts for anything. And he wasn't gone a year. I'd heard the rumors that he was way more involved in Man Who Sold the World than David is. We passed up on 
In the recording studio when we were making The Man Who Sold the World, Mick was also looking over my shoulder all the time and asking me why I did certain things and he'd be interested in the differences of all the choices you had. You could have the settings this way or that way or that way. He was much more than a guitarist, much more. And I knew he could be. We had done The Man Who Sold the World. It was a rather obscure sounding album at the time. It sounded like nothing else. The record company didn't believe in us. So with that lack of enthusiasm, Dave, David Bowie felt that he needed a, to get a manager to, to really launch him. I started basically a record production company. That was my expertise was making record deals. And Lawrence Myers had asked me if I would come in to help him and his sort of new partner by the name of Tony DeFries in developing artists. Tony told me that his job was to really basically, as far as Bo is concerned, deal with the former manager, Ken Pitt. So Mick and, uh, by this time, Woody Well, and the Rats had become like overwhelming successes, and plus he was in a hall. <laughs> it wasn't the gateway to stardom, was it, you know? With no disrespect to Hull, it's not really been noted for producing a massive amount of great musicians, except for, for Mick and the Spiders. I mean, you're not going to be in Italy and they go, oh, yes, a Hull. You have Hull, a wonderful music. It ain't going to happen. And then David called me up and he said, I met his new manager, Tony DeFries. You've got to come tomorrow. I was a little depressed anyway, so I was like, boom, I was straight on the train. I was straight back to London, you know and went straight to some small demo studio. He came without signing Stevie Wonder. And then about three months later, huge billboard, full page ad in Billboard magazine. Motown is the place for me. Stevie Wonder. DeFries comes back from America, disillusioned, not being able to sign Stevie Wonder. David's got a hit. He's my artist, right. And it was only at that time that he turned all his attention to David Bowie. I was an old hippie, basically, and uh, we started Friars in June 69. Basically, we were doing it for the music. We weren't doing it to make money. We organised the country club and we organised Friars and we organised certain other things. We first put David on in September 71. You know, we thought, well, we'll give it a go. It didn't sell out. We had a 700 capacity. I think we had about 450, 500 people in, something like that. And I remember he turned up in the afternoon and was wearing these big Oxford bags, you know, and, uh, and very long hair. And then, you know, in that evening, it was just an amazing gig. It was a really magic moment in time. I remember meeting Mick that day for the first time. So, yeah, so we did this gig, and he, he came out and he played most of Hunky Dory. And I think that was the sort of world debut of Hunky Dory, I don't because it hadn't been released at that point. I first met Bowie through Gus Dudgeon. Gus was producing him, and I played on Memory of a Free Festival and a couple of other things. And David called me directly and said he wanted me to come to his house in Beckenham. He lived in, in Beckenham then. I was living in a tiny little two up, two down in Harrow. And his hallway, you could fit my entire house in. And I just remember going. And, and we went in, and there were the lads from Hull, as I lovingly called them, and it was Woody, you know, and uh, Trevor. And that was the first time I met, met Mick. And David said, some of these pieces I want to be very piano driven. I've heard it referred to as a folk record. That's complete nonsense. It's acoustic glam is what it is. We ended up in Trident Studios, and that was really the first time that I got to know Mick really well. Lo and behold, Mick did all these beautiful string arrangements for David Bowie. It's pretty obvious that he took charge of that record and became the producer with Ken Scott. Um, I've got some <clears throat> secretive tapes of uh, the sessions with Rick Wakeman, and you can hear Ronson all the way through it. No, you're doing it wrong. And I instinctively would know what Mick was going to play. And I think if he were around today and you asked him, 
I'd hazard a guess you would say he would instinctively know what I was going to play. He came up with a string arrangement. It was his first ever string arrangement, the one on Life on Mars. Incredible. How do you come up with something that good? You know, you've got to remember this is, they were living in Harden Hall, they had no money. They had nothing, you know what I mean? So everything was done on the cheap. To pull off a string arrangement like that, it sounded like it could have been on a Sonata record produced by some big wing in New York, was phenomenal. It was a fantastic sounding record. And when you get as far as there, you would expect them to go back to... But David does a weird thing. Which is a... For those who understand, it's a chord of A-flat, but instead of having an A-flat, it's an E-flat in the bass. But then he does a thing of, of, of moving the chromatic scale. I mean, it's, it's, it works brilliantly, but it's bizarre. So you've got... Which is what I always call cinematic. He thought, um, I'm convinced David thought in pictures, because uh, all of his songs, uh, you could, virtually all of his songs you could make a film out of. Mad lyrics about Mickey Mouse and cows and Norfolk broads are like, <sighs> okay. Again, I just accepted them as like, this is this guy's art and it's a bit off kilter. He's not come on, feel the noise. They were reasonably successful. They were not unbelievably successful. But he was unbelievably successful, because he had now gone into his various persona. We were in rehearsal for Pork, and Lee Childers, who was the stage manager of Pork and a rock photographer, knew of David Bowie. There was a little article about him in Rolling Stone as a man in the dress. So he definitely was on my radar and on Cherry's and Lee's radar as the guy who was married and had a kid but wore a dress. We said, we've got to go see him, you know. And we were all pumped up because we were Warhol people and we had just, you know, hit town with a lot of publicity. And um, we kind of walked in there all full of confidence and introduced ourselves to Angie. So she went, oh, David, we'll be delighted, blah, 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 blah. You know, we all said we were pork. Warhol, members of the cast and everything. He was very taken with the factory, with the whole idea of Warhol and what, what he perceived to be the factory. We went to Andy Warhol's apartment when David met him. He came in the room, he put on the tape of Hunky Dory and then left. And then came back after it was all finished. So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that was pretty, it was a pretty strange thing to do, you know? I mean, you, you, you put somebody's tape on and then you leave. David wanted him to love this record that he'd made about him, called Andy Warhol, and Warhol didn't like it at all. So I just, yeah, I sat there and enjoyed me wine and <laughs> cheese and crackers and everything else, yeah. The next thing was the Ziggy Stardust thing, which really got into this heavier, more electric music. I think Mick's involvement was absolutely crucial. He had the rock experience. He had the sort of rock live experience, if you like, with the Rats and the other bands he'd been in. What he basically did is he rocked David up. He brought it all together and under the umbrella sound of the electric guitar. And that's what Ziggy Stardust was to me. It was much more of a rock album. It was never like um, David Bowie up front, and you guys are all all back there. I mean, half the time Mick was up, you know, with David, which was which was great to see. We can sparkle. He may land tonight. I don't tell your papa here. Get us locked up in bright. That magic moment that everybody talks about, June the. 6th, June the 12th, 1972, Top of the Pops. He was singing the chorus of Starland with Bowie, and Bowie threw his arm around him, and the whole world supposedly shifted on his axis. I mean, it's such a simple thing. It was just putting his arm around a mate. But people 
got very excited about it with the homosexual overtone. Let the children choose it. And the other moment, of course, was was what is commonly known as the guitar fellatio shot. I remember going to the side of stage, as I sometimes would, get a different kind of look. And there was David, like, noshing away on Mick's guitar. He said that he, Mick was swinging his guitar around in a certain way, that he, he had to go down to keep biting it. Bingo, you know, the sax act on the stage. But the problem was they couldn't get it in the paper. There was no room in the Melody Maker. But what they did was to buy a page. And it got seen in key places in America. We played one or two gigs, and I remember one gig we, we played, and uh, well, David wore a dress, and I wore a dress. No, no, no one ever wanted to put him in a dress. That's bollocks. Mm -hmm. Absolute bollocks. David wouldn't have shared anything with anyone. Mick was a self-contained man. He didn't seem to need much to keep him going. His cigarettes, his guitar, and a sturdy pair of shoes, and he was ready to go. A less needy person you couldn't find. I just talked him into it. I just said, oh, please. You've got eyelashes like a cow. Put mascara on them and stop fussing. Oh, well, when you say it like that, I'm just different. <laughs> Oh, that's all. Is that all right? I said, yes, now I can see your eyes. Is that too bad? And it didn't ask you to wear lipstick. He put lipstick on the next time. He went, I'm not scared. The answer was a real outrageous one, you know. She was always into the way things looked, and she was, you know, I love Angie. She gets a little crazy, you know I mean? She's like, she's almost over too enthusiastic about everything. It's like, you know, like I'm bouncing down the road and doing all this, you know, I'm thinking, oh. It was important. We had to make it theater. We had to make it touring theater, rock and roll. That excitement. Angela was watching Star Trek one night and said, wow, who should have boots like these? And uh, Ziggy Stardust thing came, uh, it was after we went to see the movie Clockwork Orange. I got to know Mick a bit, but I've since really got to know Woody Woodman, see, and I got to know Trevor when we worked together in the Cybernauts. The stories that they were telling us about, I'm not fucking wearing that, and all that kind of stuff, were hilarious. These guys all came from Hull, you know, we're going to play a rock and roll band, the lot of songs and all that. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's great. So, Do you want to see what we're going to wear? Oh, yeah, yeah right. Okay. <laughs> no way. <laughs> not, bloody it, right, I'm not putting that on. I said, no, believe me, it'll, it'll, you look great. It'll, it'll really suit you. Yeah, right. And so I don't know how I did it, but I managed to talk them into doing it. A couple of nights later, we'd done a couple of shows, and all these girls were all over them. And, they, and suddenly, the dressing room procedure was really different. It's right. Who's got the blush? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Trevor, have you finished with that mascara? Now, I remember this place we played. It was this pub. And the women in this pub, oh, talk about a rough crowd. And we had to... And I remember we had to leave the stage really quickly because people were coming up with like with this stiletto heels and people you know people just they just wanted to beat the living shit out of us when he announced his bisexuality to the melody maker i think it was quite a shock you know it wasn't a thing that you said in you know to the public you know bisexuality was a thing that you kind of kept private the gay community really wasn't out of the closet in the UK. In my experience that David was never what I would call gay, I never saw a, a gay side to him. Not that I would have cared one way or the other. He was always pretty heterosexual around me. It was more about, I think, narcissism and having attention. And I don't think it was an issue with him. His sexuality was very fluid. He did like the gay scene, though. I think he liked the sombrero, he liked the flamboyance of the queens and the clothes and the outrageousness and the style. The sombrero was a coffee bar in Kensington High Street. And they had two nights a week, which was gay night. I got invited down one night and I met up with David and with Angie and I met Freddie and Mick Ronson was there. And Mick went to go to the toilet and he came back and he said, oh, he says, 
I don't know who's gay and who's not gay. He says, I walk into the men's room and he said, look, he said, everybody was women and men and everybody in each one and nobody really knew who was where. Freddie Peretti was somebody that David met in the Sombrero nightclub in 1971. Freddie was a very kind of striking looking young man. They got on famously. David was attracted to Freddie. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> David wanted to make Freddie a star. So they put this thing together called Arnold Corns, which was Freddie was supposed to be singing. I think Freddie tried to sing. And David sang along with it too. So on the Arnold Corns tapes, what you were actually hearing is David. And Freddie was supposed to be the singer, but Freddie was not a singer. Freddie is a clothes designer. Freddie didn't have a musical bone in his body, but he helped create these wonderful outfits. I mean, David wanted to get this guy involved in many ways so that then this guy could then start making all these clothes for him. People don't realise quite what a chance he was taking, particularly after The Man Who Sold the World Cup where he was wearing a dress. Wearing a dress in Texas in 1969, if you were a man, was, you know, uh, you were bound to provoke a reaction, and that's what David did. David had gone to do a radio interview, and he'd been wearing the dress in the studio and been talking about wearing the dress, and somebody had turned up with a shotgun and had decided to start blasting out and Danny got very worried. You know, I had this vision of him dragging this dress up, running off down the street. It did cause a few problems because people would call your names and all. You know, I mean, people would kind of come down on you for it or something, you know. I mean, I wasn't bisexual or anything, but they figure like, well, David Bowie's bisexual, and then what's this guy doing playing with David Bowie? You know, he must be gay as well. Get the bus home from town. And I remember a bunch of girls or whoever was on the bus, and they'd be going like, Oh, that's your brother who's a, you know, that puff drummer. You know, they couldn't even get it right, you know. I was just thinking, oh, yeah. I said, you have to understand, lots and lots and lots of straight people support the gay community, not because they're gay. You understand? It's a question of freedom of choice. No one is expecting you to be gay. I think Mick kind of played the innocent boy from Hull a little bit, too. He kind of knew that was charming. I, I don't think he was as scared as everybody thinks he was. If it bothered me, it bothered me maybe for three or four days. What did bother me was uh, I gave my mother and father a car. It was a white Mini. Somebody came along with black paint and threw black paint all over the white Mini. It doesn't matter what people think about me, but what mattered to me was what people did to my parents. Mick was never really that way. I mean, he was always Mick. You know, he'd do the blonde hair, he'd do whatever, you know, he had to do on stage, but he was always Mick. I'd been a fan of Mother Hoople since two years before they became known. So I was the only kid in school, bouncing up and down in the playground when dudes got, got released and became a hit going, I told you so. David had been working on that song with the spiders, but he, they'd run it into the ground. And, and so we, I guess we came along at the right time. And he offered it us at DeFries's place off of Regent Street. The bass player of Motley Hoople phoned David and said, I'm out of a job, you haven't got a job, have you? And he said, why, what's happened? Well, the band's broke up, we broke up. You're joking. Right, don't break up, well, I've got some great songs. I'll write you something. And David sat cross-legged on the floor and played all the young dudes, and it was like... <laughs> it wasn't just Mark, it was Martin Bowie. A, I can sing it, and B, you know, it's huge. Why is he giving it us? So we never argued, and we just went in, and it was David, two nights, two evenings. And, and that was dude. And that song is a song of a generation. We always got on with him. Yeah. We've always been really good friends. We work together. Periodically, you know. Ronson did a, a string arrangement for the 
All the Young Dudes album on a song called Sea Diver. He wrote this whole arrangement and we got, we got in there, I was having kittens. Really struck me about Mick that he had his own identifiable way of playing. He played with a wah-wah pedal half open, so you got this tone that was nobody else had. And I used to use, press the wah-wah pedal on and just set it, set it on, a, on the tone and just leave it, just leave it like that. And I used to get this very, very kind of honking tone out of the, out of the amp. It was, it was very middle, very middle sound. So that was uh, how a lot of that uh, came about, the guitar sound. The rest of it was basically just plugging in and uh, you, you just plug the guitar in and turn it up, you know, and it's, uh, and away you go, you know, like things like uh, Gene Genie comes from basically the Muddy Waters or the, I'm a man, John Lee Hooker, and I kind of riff it. I've thought for many, 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 many years, he deserves much more credit than he ever received for that, for being an, a, a real individualistic type of player. You know Bowie's history, so you know he had a, a whole mishmash of influences, which young artists do. He wasn't really rock yet. When did everything change when he met Mick? The sound changed. Everything began to change when he met Mick. You look at that picture that I have of the two of them on the train eating lunch, and they look so exotic. There's that little look between them, and they've got some pats of butter and peas and probably, like, boiled potatoes, and they look like they've just fucking landed. Look at the state of those two. But they also look like they're really like, there's a lot of this sweet conspiratorial thing. We had two albums, three albums out, and David decided, I want to go and live in America. I want to really break America. I want to go and live there, stay there as long as I need to. And I thought it was a very good career decision. Tony said, we'll open an office in New York. And then I proposed, he goes to New York, set up his own company, which proved to be made man. I spoke to David about it. I said, this is what Tony wants to do. Is that what you want to do? He said, yeah, yes, I really want to go live in America. Thank me very much. And off they went. They all came to New York in the beginning of September for about a week. That was when the signing of, at, at RCA. I was quite close to RCA. So I spoke to RCA and played the material. I did all the things you normally do to pitch an artist. So I did a deal. When Tony DeFries went to America to sign David Bowie, he made two deals in one. He said, OK, you get David Bowie, but you also have to have Danny Gillespie. And so they made the two deals at the same time. Weren't born a man by Dana Gillespie, born very much a woman, and available on RCA records and tapes worldwide. You love like a Dufries was one of those guys that says, there, there, let me take care of everything for you. And that was the glorious thing about Main Man. From that moment on, David and I especially was offered what we wanted musically. Tony said to me, is there a point at which you would give up your interest? So I said, if I get 500,000 pounds in the next three years, you're free. And I thought, Pfft. 500,000 pounds, you know. <laughs> There's not that much money in the world. And 18 months later, they sent me a check. They were very smart, they, they, you know, they got rid of me. He needed Michael around to help with the arrangements. Mick would have been the more hands-on guy, getting the sounds sorted, getting the arrangements done, extending this chorus, putting a right out guitar solo on this song, bringing in the echo stuff. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. I think that he would have had more to do with that than David. Mm. Boy, Ronson's good. Wow.
Isn't that amazing? Just like that. See, I think sometimes with a really good arrangement and parts, you don't need a vocal. That album was the flowering of Mick Ronson. Tony began making trips to New York City. We had been meeting with Tony DeFries and going with him up to the record companies and so forth and advising. So every time he came to New York City, he would call me up, I'd have dinner with him. I was a great listener. You know, Tony really was a great talker and I was a great listener. I knew a lot of DJs in New York. We got along very well, Tony and I. We just began to build this relationship. Also, Tony needed Aaron's time. It was as simple as that. Z, could you, he could call me Z because we were both Tonys. Couldn't you uh, go to RCA and pick up records? Can you do this? Can you do that? So when he was ready to bring Bowie to New York in 72, he hired us. He made Tony Zanetta president of Main Man and tour manager. There was no organization at all. So because I was selfish or self-centered, I went to the desk and said, give me the keys, blah, blah, blah. I started organizing so I could get to my room. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I kind of became the road manager without even knowing what a road manager was. Everyone that was to do with main men, they were all a bit kind of bonkers and mad. That's what De Vries attracted to the company. These people were taken and put in positions that they'd never had before. This was kind of exciting. I mean, Ron had never seen anything like that either. To go on the first American tour, they decided they needed a pianist. Enter Mick Garson. Tony De Vries called me and he told me about Bowie, but I was a jazz musician. I said, who? When they called me up, so I, nothing. But within minutes of hearing him play, I knew he had it. Mick Ronson was the one who auditioned me, so that's the guy who really I owe the respect to. He was a great guitar player, a great string arranger. When I auditioned, he showed me the chords, it showed C, and I went C and E minor. That was the audition. He said, you got it. So as the, that's where David's singing. So little by little, I started playing. I, I did, um, let me see. So that first tour, it started in September, it ended in December. In three months, we did only 17 dates. <laughs> the Ziggy thing really kicked up in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio is a great city for rock and roll. The first date when we went to Cleveland, we uh, we went by bus. We thought that was the thing to do. We rented this bus. We were staying at the Plaza Hotel because, again, that was part of Tony's philosophy. To be a star, you had to act like a star. Where does a star stay? Not the Holiday Inn, the Plaza Hotel. There's a fountain right there next to the bus, the plaza in front of the fountain. And this bag lady comes along. <laughs> she goes to the fountain, she pulls down her pants, hikes up her skirt, squats down and takes a big shit in the fountain. <laughs> and that was the Ziggy Stardust tour. We were off to Cleveland right after that. And I said to Tony DeFries, Tony, what does a road manager do? And he said, oh, see, just make sure they find Cleveland. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> The spirits were great, the band was great, the playing was great, David was in rare form. We traveled all across the country. We sat for two weeks in Phoenix because we didn't have another date to go to. So the next date was in Miami. That's not exactly a great, plan, great booking strategy. The way he put it together could have ended up in complete disaster. Because to go to America with a few gigs under your belt, thinking, what well, were just add dates was not what America was all about. I know of two months in America, we played about 10 gigs. 
So we'd play a gig and maybe have like 10 days off and we'd play another gig. And I think the performance, the fact that people, however small the audience was, word of mouth is the strongest marketing you could ever achieve. And the performances were great. So it spread. The ordinary people in New York and LA, they got it. They were excited about it because we had also had Mark Bolin, who was wearing feather boas and eye makeup and everything. So the door was a little open for something like David. They were all decked out, each in a different, like worked out design, red hair, silver hair. Susie Fossey did the hair and they knew they were getting like great hairdos like nobody else had. It was very professional. Mick Ronson and David on stage together were very, very compelling. You know, it's like the Rolling Stones, you know? You wouldn't be the Rolling Stones unless you had Keith Richards and Mick Jagger, you know? Or The Who with, like, Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey. You know, yeah. Or The Beatles without, you know, with Lennon and McCartney. And usually, a lot of these things when these groups happen, it's usually in pairs. So David studied mime and theatrical, and he was kind of up here and very at feet. Mick was kind of the opposite. You know, he had this kind of like, this, these kind of fame kind of movements or something, you know what I mean? And I'm like, right, I'm like a bricklayer, you know? So it's like, I think I was more like a man and he was more like a woman, you know? And the costumes were, beautiful, beautiful fabrics, beautifully tailored. So I think it didn't take them too many shows dressed up in their outfits to embrace it. And they were smart enough to know, I think. But yes, at the beginning, I'm sure there was more reluctance than I ever even saw. Woody and Trevor were a little bit more, oh my God, not quite as adventurous as Mick. We all go into this nightclub and we're getting, you know, everybody's like turning around and looking and David, takes his male backup singer and starts dancing slow, just to get everybody really riled up and looking. But I think he used the whole gay world in that kind of way to get attention. I'm an alligator. I'm a mama, papa coming for you. We would play the Nashville Coliseum, the Chicago Dome. No, I remember these places we're not sold out or anything. Some of these places only had like maybe 200 people in, 500 people in or something. But it, it created this whole press thing because it looked so good in the English press. David sold out the Radio City Musical. These images wired straight over with copy, front pages of The Enemy and Melody Maker and Disc and Music Echo, or whatever. David's a big star in America. People were going mad. There was queues around the block and everything. I mean, this. It's amazing what the press can do, you know? A lot of show business, a lot of the music industry is smoke and mirrors. And the Freeze realised that early on. You've got to act the part. So they were spending money they didn't have. They were spending RCA money. We spent about 400 and some thousand dollars. We grossed $100,000. <laughs> but by December, David was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And then you knew that the same was gonna break wide open. And also there was a DJ in, in Cleveland that was very pro Bowie. We went to Cleveland, we played, played 3,000 seats. We went back to Cleveland in December and played two nights in the other side of that music hall that sat 10,000 people. So we went from 3,000 people to 20,000 people in three months. Same when we were spending some time in America then. Well, everybody says it was Ziggy Stardust in America, and I suppose it was because, you know, there's a lot of references to American people, American cities, things that happened to Bowie while he was touring. When you listen to Ziggy, there was no records that sounded like that. 
or Aladdin Sane. Records didn't sound like that. That was Mick. He was actually brilliant at divining what I meant when I would describe in words what I wanted as the shape of the solo in certain songs. The one on time is a perfect example, for instance. One thing he adored doing while recording was building up layered tracks so that there would be a great wedge of sound in certain areas of songs. And from there, he could fly off into his sinewy lines and riffs in a heartbeat. The singing of David on time and mixed playing and his ability not to be a show off the bottom line is who laid out the arrangements, who was doing all the stuff, who was giving me the charts in the studio, who was putting the earphones on, who was saying, that's a B minor chord, Mike. This was Mick Ronson. First of all, those four tours, nobody got paid. None of us got paid. Everything was petty cash. Tony put money, when there was money, he'd put money, he would pay your rent, if you had rent, he'd put a certain amount in everybody's bank account to cover their very, very basic living expenses, like Woody and Trevor, Mick, they had a flat, or like Woody had a wife back in England, so she'd get, but not much, 75 pounds a month, something, you know, something ridiculous. But everything was paid for. Someone in New York told them how much they were getting paid. Exactly what happened is I was in the airplane sitting next to Woody, and he said, what are you earning? And I said, to tell you the truth, I'm embarrassed because it's way lower than you guys, but I'm the new man on the block. I'm very happy with $800 a week. Mike thinks they're all making a fortune because this is like, you know, he hasn't been involved in this kind of what to him was big deal rock and roll. And his face turned white, and I think they were getting 30 pounds. So that started the beginning of the end of the Spiders. They went to see Dennis Katz, who had been the A&R guy at uh, RCA, who is now in private law practice. He's a music attorney. To see, so they wanted Dennis to represent them, get them a real salary. Well, this was treason to DeFries and to Bowie. Treason. I mean, the whole Bowie thing, you know, it was disgusting. I think it was on 40 quid a week throughout the whole thing, you know. It didn't matter whether you made a record, uh, you did TV, you did interviews, whatever. It was, no, no, the whole thing, 40 quid a week. When I look back, that was really unfair. Mick should be making a lot of money, or a point, a half a point, or something. But he didn't get anything. DeFries and David took Mick to the side to, like, kind of calm him down. First of all, he's, he's the key player and very needed. So I don't know exactly what went down other than, okay, Mick, do this tour and let's keep going. Basically, it was gonna be that Mick would then become a main man artist. I think the last tour we played of England went for six weeks and we was playing two shows a night. The very last gig at Hammersmith Odeon yeah, it was pretty memorable because it was the last show that we was going to do in that form. Cherry Vanilla and I come in through the crowd. It took a lot of photographs. I signed a lot of autographs. Angie. Darling, I came to say good luck. I went backstage, I had this little, you know, going backstage to wish David Glock turned into this horrible episode. You see how they pick on me and just, you know, make me feel terrible? Well, you're just a girl. What do you know about makeup? Exactly. That's what I say all the time. So I went to see the boys. The boys looked great. They were in a good mood. They made me laugh. We had a good, you know. I said, I'll be there, you know that. I'll be there shouting you on, cheering you on. They said, yes, yes, good. And then they went on and it was such a brilliant show. Of all the shows on this tour, 
this this particular show will remain with us the longest because not only is it not only is it the last show of the tour, but it's the last show that we'll ever do. Thank you. I think Woody and Trevor were really confused because the band didn't know anything about this until the encore. And then David said, this is the very last show where you're gonna play. The people went, what? It was like the wind was knocked out of everyone's lungs. They all went, <gasps> I couldn't believe it. I did the same thing. I was like, well, that's a turn up for the books. I was like, oh great, now we're out of work again. <laughs> I thought, oh, great, here we go. I was very emotionally hurt by this whole thing. It was almost like we were all a little bit of Ziggy Stardust. And when it ended, it ended for all of us. You know, we, but, you know, David was still David Bowie. Tony DeFree still had millions of dollars. And the rest of us were sticky, standing there like with our thumbs up our asses. Now what am I supposed to? You know, last week I had my own airline tickets and charge cards to everywhere. In the, no, I, I, I don't know, where's my rent coming from? You know, it was, it was very difficult. Your whole identity was wrapped up in this. We played Japan before we played England. And it was in Japan that the decision was made that the whole Ziggy thing should stop. I remember David uh, calling my room and he said, uh, Mick, can you come up? Can you come up here? And he was sitting in bed and Tony was sitting on the side of the bed. And I sat in the chair on the other side of the bed and then we talked about this thing. I said, look, Mick, you know, we think that we want to do this. I had sprayed Trevor's fucking those things, those big side jobbies, silver every night. These were my kids, you know what I mean? I adored them. I don't, I don't, I never had brothers that age. They were like my brothers, I adored them. The record's a bit plastic, you know. It, it, they don't, it's not world peace. It's just, and it's great entertainment, but it's entertainment. So if he decided to retire Ziggy, so what? It was almost like when the Beatles broke up, the Beatles were much bigger than they were when they were together. The Ziggy thing was so it, it popular. It would have been kind of silly to go out and play Ziggy again and again and again and again and again. Because you're not moving anywhere, you're not developing anything, you're not growing, you're not doing, doing anything. You're just kind of repeating yourself. It's, it's lasted for so many years, that period. And the reason why it's lasted so many years is because people can only remember it, they can't see it again. And uh, <clears throat> we kind of didn't want it to break up at the time. Um, because it seemed like we were on such a roll, we were doing so well, but yet we hadn't played Europe. We never went back to the United States again. Rono continued on and uh, De Vries was going to manage him. And then we went to France and we started recording pinups. And we were in this, what you would call almost like a castle and there was a chef and we'd stay there. So we were just doing music and no one went too far away. You go to your room, come down the next day, start playing. So it wasn't like we ended the last show of Ziggy and then waited for a year before doing anything. And it was pretty instant. The pin-up sessions were a lot of fun. On a few tunes, we hooked the piano up, the grand piano, to a Leslie speaker, Hammond Leslie, and it would get this sound, yeah, whirling, exactly. That was fun. Uh, and it was so light and it was so easy because it wasn't his music. He had nothing to prove. And I think things began to suddenly spark between Susie and Mick at that point. Up till then, Susie had been like a big sister or a little sister. They were very close. Yeah, we saw Mick and Susie sneaking off. And I believe that was the beginning. It was really romantic. It was a beautiful villa. It was just outside of Rome. It was lovely. And one thing led to another, and by the time we left Italy, Mick and I were boyfriend and girlfriend. I laughed and shook his hand. And I think Pinups was a great album. I think we played real good. I searched for form and land. For years and years I roamed. Lulu came out to Paris and recorded Manu's Solar World. 
and we recorded it right there and then at the same sessions at the same time. Mike Garson played piano, Mick Ronson and David, myself, everybody was singing. And um, yeah, we had a part they had a party and we were up the whole night. It was fun. It's a lot of fun. When we finished pinups, you know, Tommy the first said, he suggested, he said, well, you'll uh, make your own album. After the shock ending of David, and David took a couple of years off. Well, Mick should have done the same thing, or at least taken a year, you know, to figure out what he was going to do. But the main man machine was in full motion, and they said, right, now it's your turn, Mick. Out there, off you go. So he put together Slaughter, put together that tour, that show, you know, Mick had the costumes and it was the big band and we had the backing singers and whatever, but, you know, he was still sounding a lot like David because he was half of David's sound. The criticism was it was like a Bowie concert without David. I see a few celebrities in the audience. The audience seemed to like it, but it, you could tell it wasn't really doing that well. When he did that show at the Rainbow that Jeffries had him do, and it was supposed to be his big rock star coming out thing, Mick was extremely nervous. He wasn't ready to take over that stage at the Rainbow yet. He needed some warm-up gigs. Mick suddenly had to shoulder all the responsibility. He didn't have a Mick Ronson on the side doing what Mick had done for David. It was just Mick. So it wasn't as strong. As brilliant as Mick was, He's not really a front man. You know, we all were kind of in our megalomaniac, mean man phase of we can do no wrong, because look what we did. Look what we did, we created this star. Mix next. Tony DeFries only knew how to make one kind of artist. That was a rock star in the image of David Bowie. That's the way I feel, and he tried to do that to Mick, and I thought that was wrong. What he didn't realize is Mick needed David to really make that work. It was very difficult for him, I think. He had a lot of drinking, you know, it was... It kind of went, slid down a bit. He just wasn't made to be a front man, Mick. I mean, DeFries said, you're going to be the next Bowie. Mick said, fine. <laughs> but, but that was as far as it went. Your first solo album, Mick, were you disappointed with the response to Slaughter? Well, not disappointed, because I think Slaughter, as an album, did pretty well for somebody's first solo album. Mick would have probably had a better career going into orchestrating, arranging, making movie soundtracks, you know, and eventually make his own songs, albums, whatever. But Jeffries pushed him right into, you're the next rock star. And I don't think he was ready for that. What he didn't realize is Mick needed David to really make that work. He was uncomfortable if he was the central focus. <laughs> I don't know what sessions were which, really. The Diamond Dog sessions, I don't know what they sort of imploded. It was just kind of went in the studio now and again. It wasn't really to put an album together or anything. It was just to record some tracks. Because I was at a lot of those sessions, I only remember me and David there. That's when it started to drift apart a bit. He'd moved on from Mick too quickly, and then in so doing, had um, prevented Mick from getting the true acknowledgement for what he put into the creation of the sound. With both Tony DeFries in a business sense and David, I think that they have a bit of an attitude that everybody is replaceable. I would gotten a call from uh, a dearly departed friend named Michael Kamen. He had done the music for the Joffrey Ballet and David was there and they got chatting and then David said, I need a guitarist because I'm getting ready to go do a tour, and uh, Mick Ronson's left the band. Do you know anybody that, that might fit the bill? And Michael gave him my name. Uh, I went and did an interview, and I got the gig. I was a young kid who had a good, like Keith Richards kind of sensibility with a little Mick Ronson there. Diamond Dogs, to me, essentially, it's a Spider's album. He just didn't play on it, because uh, I know that Ronson was around when those songs got played on the 1984 show, for example. For when, 1973, the album came out a year later. He wasn't on it, but it still sounded like that. And that was 
kind of angry with Bobby. And he's got dissed the band because Rono and Trevor and Woody were part of it as far as I was concerned. And I brought that up. I said, are you expecting me to sound like, are you expecting me to be Mick Ronson? I mean, I was very forward about it. No, I like the way you play, you do what you do. The Diamond Dog Show cost a lot of money. It cost a lot of money to put together. It cost a lot of money to tour. It was this big clumsy set. I mean, David decides he's not using that set anymore. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> he's had it with the Diamond Dog set. Well, DeFries was not happy about this. I mean, it cost like eh, $250,000, $300,000, which sounds like nothing now. It was millions then. That was definitely friction. His drug use was huge, I think, at one point in his life. From like not doing any drugs, suddenly he's like, there wasn't enough cocaine in the universe. <laughs> it did actually get in the way of all sorts of things, and just trying to deal with him became more and more difficult. This is not good. This was during the Diamond Dog séjour in New York. And, I mean, Mick was gone by then. Mick did a lot of work. Mick wasn't just a guitarist. He arranged strings, he arranged songs. You don't see credits for that. You don't see production credits. As far as I'm concerned, Mick wants to produce some of those records. I don't care whose name's on there. I don't give a shit. It was Mick, and he didn't get his due. He didn't get credited. And my pleasure. Tony and David had a very, very close relationship. They would speak on the phone daily for hours. Everything was plotted out. Everything was probably overthought. And what Tony did was he put himself in between David and anybody else. David's pretty capable, but that's what he depended on Tony DeFries for. Tony DeFries took all of that out of his hands. Donna says, Don, Don Cleft, you know, we all had secretaries. We all, everyone had staff. We all went to New York. It was wonderful. It was a big party. And of course, David was paying for it. And the communication began to break down. It totally broke down during the Diamond Dogs tour. When David and DeFries broke up, it was a standoff. It was all starting to crumble. Tony DeFries was in America, Mick Ronson was in London, Susie was in London, and nobody was looking after them. When I was with Mick, I thought Mick was a pop star. I thought we had tons of money, you know? I thought we were living in this gorgeous place in Hyde Park Gate, nine rooms, and we had our own clothing designer staying with us. I mean, my only role model was David and Angie. I thought we had tons of money. I thought Mick, I didn't know what Mick was only on 50 quid a week. Mick was a school gardener. I was a hairdresser from Beckenham. We had no clue about royalties or how much money you could make, or how much money there was around. Mick and I didn't know. We had no, we had no clue. And Mick's just going, we've got to form a bum, we've got to go in now. Because Mick was a very intuitive guy. I mean, he's, he sensed the drama, and that can usually lead to something good musically. And so we formed a band, we went in and we did my first solo album. I said to Mick one night, you know, let's go down the village. I knew this guy, Paul Colby, owns a place. We went to the bitter end, and we're sitting in there having a drink late afternoon, and Bob Dylan walks in with Bob Norris. Dylan sits down at the next table to us and plays the entire Desire album to Bobby Norris. And Mick got drunk, and he got thrown out three times. Paul Colby threw him out. And... The last time, Mick said, if you throw me out one more time, I'm coming back in through that fucking window. <laughs> so Colby let him stay, and stay he did. And then he rang me, I went home, and about three or four days later, Mick rang me and said, here, I'm playing with Bob Dylan. <laughs> Now, Mick had never liked Bob Dylan. This is what really jars me about this whole thing, is Mick had never liked Bob Dylan. Mick used to think he sounded like Yogi Bear. I mean, he certainly wasn't a fan, and I wasn't either. We were glam rockers. <laughs> and when Mick played with them, it was magic. That simple country stuff with suddenly this little blazing licks of guitar. I mean, it sounded brilliant. I actually was very fortunate to spend a little bit of time with him in the summer of 77 in um, Woodstock because he got a bit involved there with the Bearsville record label. I'm going to scout out a few groups to produce um, for another couple of months or so. I've got a lot of tunes out I've got to finish off. And I've been uh, in, the, in the middle of getting a record deal for myself. But uh... And I have to say that at the time, Mick was feeling a bit low 
because he'd begun to feel himself that he'd been washed to the side slightly in the wave of everything that had gone through and the slipstream had sort of veered him off and I think at that stage he was beginning to feel that he hadn't been given quite the credit that he felt he deserved really. And then things got tough for us after that. We didn't have any money. I got pregnant and I was in Woodstock and Mick had a band that's why he put a band together. But it was nothing, it wasn't going anywhere really. We just lived from paycheck to paycheck, really. Money just didn't genuinely didn't interest him, and it caused him a lot of grief, you know. But he just wasn't interested. He was only interested in, in the music and various aspects of it. I mean, to him, if he could find a Mexican heavy metal band, you know, to do in East LA, he was there, because it was different, you know, it was interesting. At the end of the Bob Dylan tour, Mick got a bill instead of a check. What do you ask? getting their checks, and Mick got a bill, because he's one of those people that says, buy the bar a drink, you know, that was Mick. And also, he liked to gamble, and he always lost, which didn't suit us at all, so we had to leave our house, we had no money. So we went on TWA getaway cards back to London. I had a band called The Rich Kids, and we just signed to AMI, and we were looking for a record producer. And we tried out a bloke at AMI, and it wasn't quite working. And we had an office in Marabone, and the phone rang one day, nobody else was there, and I answered the phone, and this bloke went, oh, is, uh, is Pete Walmsley there, please? And I went, no, he's not here at the moment, he's popped out. I said, who's that? He said, Mick. I said, that's not Mick Ronson, is it? Because I knew he knew him. And he said, yeah, it is, actually, who's that? And I said, it's Glenn Matlock. And he said, oh, I've heard about you. I said, well, look, we're, listening, we're looking for a, a, a producer for this band that we just signed to EMI, are you interested? He went, yeah, all right then. And I said, we're rehearsing in a couple of days' time. And um, he said, well, I'll come down. He was rehearsing in Putney. And I went, oh, well, bring your guitar. And he went, all right. And he did. And he came down to rehearsal. And we sort of knocked for a number of two. And then we went down the pub and we got him famously. He was touring and travelling and looking for work. Literally, he worked from job to job to job just to pick up the paycheck. John Mellencamp was quite willing to give Mick credit for the work that Mick did on Jack and Diane, the way that Mick took that song, created a, just an incredible riff, a structure to the song that John Mellencamp ever since has leaned back and gone, wow. Jack and Diane had been a song that had been drifting around for ages. Mick gets hold of it. It's an American number one. And then Mick went off and did Lisa Dalbella. That was the time he was meant to be producing Tina Turner. And this is typical, Mick. He said, you've got a corn on your toe to Tina. And Tina's a pretty big artist and all the rest of it. And she just starts laughing, and Mick goes, like, I've got a corn on mine as well, you know. So they, now they're comparing corns on their toes. And Tina loves him, just loves him. She wants Mick, she wants him to do the record, and Mick worked his way through that one and wound up not doing the record, you know. He was in touch with David quite a lot, I believe. Right through that Morrissey period, he was in touch with David. I hadn't seen Mick for a while. And I was even surprised that he would even show up. I mean, I just had this guitar painted. And uh, he's flinging it around and he's putting things in it, stuff like that. I'm going to stand on the side and say, oh, my God, you know. And I think Mick saw my face. And uh, we were laughing about it later on, you know. But uh, yeah, I was going, what the hell is he doing to my guitar? He went back to working with Ian. Which, you know, Ian was great. He always... With, there's, it's, there's Morrissey really been trying to get in touch. They want to find out where he is. Morrissey called me one day and uh, said, who should we get to produce the next album? And I had said, why don't we get Mick Ronson? And I put word out to a few different people and um, the phone rang and I picked up. Oh, is that Mark? He said, my name is Michael Ronson. And I was like, you know, trying not to look excited as I was. He said, I hear you want to talk to me about producing Morrissey. So a few days went by and Mick called and said, I said, oh, Morrissey said, can you come to my house on Friday? He says, oh, I can't on Friday, I'm babysitting for my sister. At the time, you know, Morrissey was like the sort of hottest thing in the world. I thought, 
do you think she could get somebody else to babysit? Says, Let me see what I can do. And so from there, then we got all the connections happening and um, he ended up doing the Morrissey album, Be Your Arsenal. Morrissey was the last big check that Mick got that enabled him to live as he liked, live in comfort, eat what he wanted. The house was as warm as you want to be, but without Morrissey, that would have been difficult. My friend, who was a radiographer, said to me, your brother don't look well. And I said, no, he's not, you know, he's in a lot of pain and he's not well. So he said, what, what's, what are they giving it? And I said, well, this blood test, you know. And he went, do you want me to do an x-ray? So I said, that'd be great. So anyway, so we took him in. We had no forms or anything. It just so happened that he just took this x-ray. And then he came out and he went, he said, you know what? He said, I think he needs to, I think I'd like to get a radiologist to see him. When we saw him at the Freddie Mercury gig, he'd been working on your arsenal for Morrissey and uh, he was, he was tired. You know, he was, the first thing he did when he got to Wembley was lay down and go to sleep on the couch, you know. But then once he got his energy back, he was up and about and finally got to play on the song he should always play on, which was Heroes. Yeah, the concert was kind of my baby, actually. Um, and one of the first people I spoke to was David Bowie. And, uh, and David said, yes, sure, of course I'll come. Uh, can I suggest we use Mick? Um, I said, oh, that would be wonderful, you know, especially as you wanted to do Heroes, and, and that's, that's, that, that would fit in perfectly. And Mick, he said, do you realise he's, he's really unwell? He asked the radiologist that was there if she would actually do a scan on him, and she was kind enough to say yes. She's a lovely lady called Jo Wright, and um, and she did this scan on him. And then they, she took me aside into an office. Meanwhile, you know, this is all sort of. So we got there at nine o'clock. So time was going on. It was probably about ten, ten thirty then. Michael's still walking around, looking a bit grey and in pain, and. Um, so she took me aside in the office and said, um, you know, um, I, I've just done his scan, she said, and I can see three tumours on his liver. We were celebrating the death of Freddie Mercury, and everyone was having a great time. Roger Taylor, John Deacon, David Bowie, Mick Ronson, Ian Hunter, Brian May, me and Phil. It's like, this is amazing. The most exciting three minutes of my musical career. You know, that, that really was a nice little part of the show, I thought, with, with uh, David and Mick. And, and that, that sort of, there was a sort of completion there. That was lovely. And he was on great form. You, you wouldn't have known that, uh, uh, that this was a man who was uh, terminally ill. And then I got a phone call at the weekend from Mr Morgan saying to me, um, I, you know, I've got some really bad news for you. This is called endocarcinoma of the liver, and your brother's got three months to live, or thereabouts. I was like... ...on the line, and come some guests on the show. And I asked him if he would come for old time's sake and, and work on a, a song. And uh, he said he'd be delighted to do that. And uh, he came along and played his usual breathtaking solo. I think it's pretty obvious when we, you know, ha having to ask people for money to support Mick was an awful thing to have to do. I mean, it was humiliating to say, look, you know, Mick's got no money and he's really ill and he's got nowhere to live and we've got a house for him, but we haven't got any money. And he was great. I mean, he would wait, oh, there'd be one hour a day where he would feel good with the morphine and everything and he would ring everybody. How are you doing? Not like how he was doing, how are you doing, you know? He took one course of chemo and said, this is going to kill me faster than the other thing. So he started alternative healing. And that's when he started working with Morrissey. During that period, that's when he started working with Morrissey. And I think he knew that his time was close. And I think that he confided in Morrissey a lot. I think he did. And then as he was getting worse and he was getting worse, I was, I'd ring him aside, I should maybe come over for a bit, you know. So in the end, he's like, why don't you come over? 
so I came over, for, for, and that was when he, he, he went, you know. Well, I was downstairs making a cup of tea, she was upstairs with him, and, uh, and that was that, you know. The band The Spiders from Mars got me the kind of fame that I had in the early 70s, and the lead guitarist with that band was Mick Ronson, and unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> Uh, tragically, he, he um, succumbed to cancer uh, three or four days ago. Um, and his, in his passing, it, uh, I, I want to say that of all the early 70s guitar players, Mick was probably one of the most influential and profound, and, and I, I miss him a lot. And then I have to introduce you to two people that come up and accept this award. That's his wife, Susie, and his only daughter, Lisa. To this day, when I meet people who have met him, they usually don't talk about his guitar solos or his production skills. They talk about what a decent, funny, down-to-earth person he was. And for everybody else that listens to his music or has been influenced by him in any way, you know, Mick rocks. <laughs> I think what people miss is me being there, you know? Because there was some electricity there, there was something about this thing. When two people get together, there's some invisible energy, there's, some in, there's something that's kind of magic. You don't know, you can't put your finger on it, you can't say what it is, but it's something there. And you, can, you can't describe it or anything, it just is. And it either is right or it's wrong, you know? It just happened that it was right. Is there a way you could play something that would be commemorable to your relationship and your time and your experience? Well, I've never, I've never played a, a tribute to him or written a piece for him, and I would love to have the privilege to do it in this space. And since you knew him and I knew him, and he really was my ally on that tour, I'll try to. Um, just sit here and create something, okay? Thank you. we knew yeah. without Mick Ronson. No. No. Would Bowie have been Bowie without Mick Ronson? No, I don't, don't think he would have done. Not the same David. It might, I think you would have had David, but it wouldn't have been the same David. Mick was absolutely fundamental to the way it developed at that time. I have to say, I think Mick's early work with David was essential to, and it's some of my favorite stuff. It's utterly brilliant. I have to say, I think David's genius would have shone through anyway. I think there was nothing to, that was going to stop that. He was like a beacon. Um, but I think Mick was the perfect, the perfect sort of um, complement in those days. Mick and the other spiders brought him into that rock, made him a rock star. Not a theater star, not a cabaret star, but a rock star. I know that he had a big influence musically on David. There's absolutely no doubt the icing on the cake when it came to the musicianship was Ronson. But what he did is he, he made things easier for David. You need to have somebody to come in and put the decoration on. Rono was the right man at the right time. Mick's contribution was very important. His body was built, he was gorgeous and glorious, successful with women and could play the guitar like a virtuoso. What more could you want? He was one of the loveliest people I've ever met. He was such a lovely guy, kind, very gentle. He was very humble. He was a fantastic arranger. And because uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time 
with at the time with David and and he used to say when I found Mick Ronson I, I, I found my Jeff Beck you know he said I thought I've got my Jeff Beck here he did have a very distinct way of being melodic but ferocious at the same time not too many guitars can do that I don't think Mick knew how good he was you know I think if Mick had realized how good he was I think he thought that if he kicked up a bus and left, they'd just get somebody else. I don't think he realised what a talented person he was. I remember talking to him, and, you know, just about me being in pistols and then doing the Rich Good thing, and he was going, you got to get it right, you only get one chance. And I didn't think much of it at the time, but looking back, you know, that's what he meant. In creating the legend that is David Bowie, um, Mick was a major, major part. It seems amazing, really, that Ziggy and the Spiders were only together for about 18 months, but there's no doubt in my mind that the collaboration of Woody, Trevor and Rono made for one of the best trios of its time. songs and all that and I said yeah, yeah it's great so, do you want to see what we're gonna wear I think I was more like a man and he was more like a woman he was definitely mr. godlike creature with his shirt off and his brown body and his blonde hair all the females on the tour wanted to have sex with Mick he was so marvelous to tease because he was so good-looking take that shirt off that's a surfer boy we're gonna get America and people came to see me as much as they would come to see him you looked at David, who was like from another planet, and then you looked at Mick, who was like God's gift to women, you know, I mean, it was like a lethal combination. He was a simple man from Hull who adored music. I still rate Mick Ronson as one of the most influential rock and roll guitar players in history. He was everything to me. He was not only my big brother, he was like my hero too. I saw him write an arrangement on a player's cigarette packet. There was so much wonderful stuff about him. I ironed all the boys' shirts because of Rono. Mick kind of didn't even know who Morrissey was. And I got so stoned. I've never been that stoned. I don't think I've ever been that stoned in all my life, you know. The thing with Rano is I could very rarely understand a word he said. He had a Hull accent. He'd have, he'd have to repeat things five times. And that was the Ziggy Stardust tour. We were off to Cleveland right after that. He knew how to elevate David that bit more. And by doing that, he elevated himself a little bit. I said, oh, well, anyway, great things come out of Hull. And he said, yeah, only two good things that came out of Hull was fish and my sister. They just wanted to beat the living shit out of us. This is the story of Ronson's life. Great, brilliant. This is rock and roll. I'm all for it. The equipment helps a little bit, but I think more often than not, it's, it's in... It's in the, your own personality, it's in your own makeup, it's in your own fingers, you know. Most recently, we lost great friend Mick Ronson. He's the lead guitar player with my first successful band, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders. I was fortunate enough to know Mick right until the end of his life. Um, and in the last year of that life, I, I, I've gotten back very closely with him. If Mick had lived on, he would have become a major producer and arranger. And of course, he would have remained one of rock's great guitar players.